All right, let's get started on the Queensland update for the National Biosecurity Roundtable. Many of you have been with us over the past two days at the Queensland Biosecurity Partners Forum, and it's great to see those of you who have stuck around uh, till the end of the day today. It's a, it's a pretty long afternoon. For those who are new, the way that we're working our sessions, um, you'll see that you don't have the ability to turn on your video or your microphone, but you're most welcome to ask questions in the chat. So we've been using that. That's up in the top of your screen. It's a little speech bubble with two lines. And if you open up that up, you can ask any questions. If we have opportunity, there is a little bit of time this afternoon. If we have opportunity, I'll post some of your questions to the speakers. For those that we run out of time for, please feel free to add them in the chat. And I'm sure our speakers would be happy to type them back to you as the next speaker is talking. Historically, we've always run the Queensland Biosecurity Partners Forum and the National Biosecurity Roundtable uh, together at the same time. So uh, traditionally, face to face, we might do a couple of days of uh, our workshop and, and then the roundtable would follow um, on from that. So today we are carrying on that theme and we're carrying on the engagement theme from the Queensland Biosecurity Partners Forum today. The presentations in today's roundtable really focus on the National Biosecurity Strategy, biosecurity awareness and targeted education priorities, and a case study on the Safer Online Seeds project. We're going to get straight into it. And we're going to kick off with Joe Baratsko from DOOR talking about delivering the Commonwealth Biosecurity 2030. Over to you, Joe. We've just got you on mute, Joe. Oh, still on mute, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone, and apologies for the usual um, comment I'm going to make, which is I actually can't locate my PowerPoint slides at the moment because the system is refusing to upload them. So I'm going to ask if my colleague Gail would mind loading them up for me. I've got them here as well, Joe, that if you need me to do it. Yeah, it just doesn't seem to be feeling happy about. Oh, there we are. Beautiful. Um, is that you now in control, Malcolm? No, that's your colleague. Gail, you have them online. OK, um, thank, thanks everyone. I realise this is a, a bit of a clunky start, but yes, I'm Jo Ledesco from the Commonwealth Department of Agriculture. I have um, worked in biosecurity uh, in various guises for a number of years now, and um, I suppose uh, talking today about the Commonwealth Biosecurity 2030 strategy is is um, something I'm very happy to do. Uh, one of the issues around a big system like biosecurity and with so many external focus points is it's very hard to keep keep the focus on where you're going and this roadmap is our attempt um, to do that. Uh, Gail, if you'd like to. Okay, so I don't know how many people online have, have um, realised we do have a new strategy document or have had an opportunity to look at it. It is available from our website. Um, but the purpose, um, this document, for example, is um, it, it's basically our attempt to determine the roadmap we need to follow to deal with the sort of changing threat environment we're seeing for biosecurity, particularly driven by global factors. Um, it was also in the government's mind a key contribution to its agenda to support the Ag 2030 um, uh, plan that the government has to support industry with its 100 billion by 2030 agenda. Um, for us, it will be important to guide our projects, initiatives, and investments, and in how we move forward. We had a significant um, uh, funding funding boost last budget, which has provided a down payment on us taking steps forward through this strategy. Um, it, it, it's an interesting document if you have a look at it because it, it's both simple and complex, but um, really, we have not had a document like this for some time. And, you know, for example, a number of our state and territory colleagues have had documents. I know Queensland does, and we all have our own slightly different lens on them. But um, it was a critical point in our mind um, in terms of needing to set ourselves something that we could guide us, that we could talk to our um, stakeholders and partners around, and that um, effectively gave the whole of government a vision about what the biosecurity issue was. Um, Big governments have big issues and biosecurity is not always the first thing on their mind, although COVID has assisted, unfortunately, in at least raising the word biosecurity to higher profile. Uh, 
I think I mentioned in passing, one of the big drivers for this was, um, and I know many of you will have heard this through different presentations and in different reports, was just a mm. sense that um, the biosecurity environment, threat environment, as we like to call it occasionally, um, it is has always been growing and becoming more complex. And there's nothing in our mind that has changed our perception that that is the case. Um, and in fact, some of the um, disruptions we're seeing through COVID are actually intensifying in part some of the risks we already saw. So not only are the volumes at the border increasing, um, even holding for having nearly no travellers, um, the supply chains behind them and the pathways through which both the commodities and the way they get here, the ships, the containers are changing um, and getting more complex for us. Um, global climate change is changing the natural distribution of pests and diseases and tra changing trade patterns are moving them to places we wouldn't expect. So for us, um, you know, once when you might have said this commodity comes from here, those pests are there and going this pathway, we would say low, medium, high risk. It's not that clear cut for us at the moment. Um, and so we think we need to have a business transformation agenda that um, to deal with this kind of environment and to keep managing um, biosecurity risk effectively and do it efficiently because at the end of the day, we are also a constraint on um, border movement and a cost to business. We're going to have to transform how we do. You know, you can hear words like work smarter and I think that's probably where we are. Um, and business transformation is a slow, steady process and so committing to it takes a bit of effort. Uh, some of the challenges we face in thinking about what we can see and how we get ourselves there is, um, you know, sometimes you just need that jolt and you need everyone to see the same vision you do. But the systems we run um, are not set up for the complex supply chains we have now, and we can do a better job of understanding risk a lot earlier in the pathway and relying um, more effectively on information that others have. Um, we need to work on our relationships. Um, We've got plenty of close relationships at the border with border agencies and with states and territories and with other industry parties who are who are part of that system with us and there is a lot more we can do in that regard. We have data, everyone's got data, it's a much overused word, we have information and we have intelligence. Do we have all the right data, all the right intelligence and all the right capability to understand what it's telling us and then to make use of that data? Nope, I think we can probably do more there. Um, and people, you know, people are critical. It's still a people game, but just having more people the way we do business now is probably not sufficient for us. And so um, not only do we need highly capable people, we need an environment that supports them to do the decisions they need to do. And a lot of that is around not only business practice change, but also around technologies and uh, other innovations that we can bring on board to um, assist with that. You know, we talk a lot and I know Malcolm does from the Queensland perspective from your own investments around um, new detection technologies. We have 3D screening technology with um, detection algorithms. We have uh, remote goggles, which means instead of having everyone actually on site, they can look at it remotely, which frees up resources and enables us to redeploy to more important places. Um, and the other thing is just simply our regulatory settings. Um, it, it's good practice to say, are we really, is our, is our legislation, our regulations supporting the outcomes we want? Um, one thing I do know about our current um, minister, he is um, very supportive of making us operate smoothly and seamlessly at the border, but not at the expense of biosecurity risk management. And he considers that his primary responsibility. So um, the document sets out our goal. Um, this is the sort of goal you would expect to see in a Commonwealth document of this ilk, um, but it, it, it is it is true in so many levels. Um, we are a risk-based biosecurity system. We are looking at economic and code, agricultural interests, but also environment, national security and impacts. Well, it's not specified as detailed there, but also impacts of, for people around how they live their lives. And as we know from threats like zoonotics, um, there is a human health element that comes comes with biosecurity risk generally. And consistent with our appropriate level of protection, that's a lovely technical word, but it's just meant to reflect the fact that there is an international uh, trade environment out there that has concerns about unwarranted um, constraints on border movement. And um, uh, we, we have determined that our, our objective is to reduce 
um, biosecurity risk as close as possible to zero, but not zero. And the reality is, um, as I'm sure many of you would accept and we have talked about before, is we can't get biosecurity risk to zero. Um, there's always a lot of discussion about our regulated pathways and how we control cargo and people coming in. But um, and as residents of Queensland, you'll be know we have an enormously long and complex natural border to the north, which is a high risk point and it is very hard to manage. Um, thank you. Um, this. In the strategy, we try to synthesise a whole range of um, context for where we thought we were going to be um, left. And we considered, as was in the previous slides, what some of those key enablers, you know, our people, our technology, our funding. And we distilled those to what we thought our nine strategic actions um, might be in this space, which I will not read through at length on the screen. Um, I'm sure you can see them. but. At the end of the day, a lot of them are synthesised to um, it's probably four themes in my mind. We need um, stronger partnerships. We need better data analytics. We need better systems and technology. And we need um, a more sustainably funded system that can respond to these emerging needs. Otherwise, our actions are a little bit of a, um, a focus on our primary responsibility, which is pre and at border. But um, the Commonwealth is a key partner in a national system as well. And we do participate, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in post-border activity, particularly around national preparedness and response. So um, you have to do the best you can to prevent the risk emerging. And once, unfortunately, when it does arrive, we need to be um, effectively engaged and capable to respond as efficiently as we can. Um, I think we're all pretty cognizant of the ongoing burden and costs of established pests and animals that um, that actually settle here. The document um, itself uh, then, then committed us to some early steps that we would like to um, achieve by the end of the year. Um, I'm actually smiling because this is um, a slightly older slide deck and I had rearranged this just to be a little bit more helpful to the conversation. But there's probably three um, three sort of layers to our early actions. The first are around um, the purpose of a document like this, which is partly it's to provide our contribution to the national discussion around what a national biosecurity strategy may entail, and we'll move on to that shortly. The second is um, a, a bit around some transparency and accountability for both ourselves and our stakeholders in government about what we have done and what we are doing. So. This is a strategic plan. It's quite detailed. Um, the nine actions I flipped on the screen and come with about 100 sub actions. But what we'd like to do is define annual action plans that give some granularity to that strategy. Um, we have also been um, blessed with a number of reports by our Inspector General of Fire Security and occasionally the Audit Office about their concern about our ability to deal with systemic risk. So we're also committing to do a report on how, how effectively we have been implementing our responses to those recommendations. Um, and I think in doing so, that will show us areas where we are not embedding the response we would like into our systems. We're very interested in people at, in both our northern border, hence work on the Northern Australia biosecurity strategy, which we do with um, industry and with the three northern states slash territories. Um, we're also really, really invested in strengthening our support for Pacific and near neighbour partnerships. Um, not only is it uh, good for them in general, but they are a pathway into Australia and we see that there needs to be some always engaged, but a bit more focus. We are also just starting a process of working with states and territories and industry and other groups on um, a couple of years of national preparedness exercising. This year, we're probably going to start with some workshops on some critical national issues and, and test out where we think that what is a national response look like? What are the core elements? Therefore, how, what would we move on to test and exercise and what other changes can we make? Um, it mashed in that list, and Gail, if you don't mind moving to the next one, is a whole bunch of issues that are a little bit more integral to us. Um, we have got some early investment in new technology, and we're doing a series of um, pilots and efforts with industry, which I won't go through in detail around how we can do things slightly differently. Um, 
and how we can take um, arrangements and regulation out of a system that is not has no purpose but is distracting to where we allocate our resources. So that can sound alarming, but in general, we believe there are a number of highly compliant pathways that we can put, put stronger assurance around that will free resources up for the higher risk um, elements. So we've done some pilots. We're not rushing into things. We're piloting a whole range of things that will give us the evidence base to say, are these, um, are these things we think would be a great idea or are they things that we can demonstrate will work, um, maintain our risk profiles, but also enable us to free up the resources for more risky areas um, and liberate some of these other areas. So there's a few things you'll see there. Um, one is also around partnerships. You know, we all operate at the port, industry operate at ports, states operate at ports, we operate at the port. How do we take a model that integrates our efforts together a little bit more seamlessly on that? Um, I'm sure Malcolm has many views. Um, and, you know, we need to look at, for example, Western Sydney Airport as a greenfield site. If you just go back, Gail, thanks. Um, there are a few issues there uh, that, um, that say, well, if it's a new airport, how would we design the clearance model that we would expect for the future? So discussions around that. Um, there's one other thing I'd just like to draw attention to. It's over there obliquely refresh the National Biosecurity website. A couple of years ago, um, as part of a national agenda, we tested a national biosecurity website, which was meant to be not an Australian government one, but just a place where people could go and find information on biosecurity. And we're going through further effort to build the concept of what that what that website might be able to deliver. It's not meant to be singularly government focused and industry and community groups. Um, should perceive it as an option for them to share information and stuff with us. So if you do see things coming around on that, we really encourage you to participate. Um, so that was all I was going to talk about Com Biosecurity 2030 because we're going to move on to a discussion about national biosecurity strategy. I'm just going to beg everyone's favour for five seconds and ask Gail if she could deload that one and reload the one I emailed because I think I adjusted the slides a little bit and Malcolm will have a different version. Gail, while you're, uh, sorry, not Gail, Joe, while you're waiting for that, we've just got a question in from Sandra. With the risk of yeah. African swine fever, do you have sniffer dogs at all of the airports? Um, to be perfectly honest, I think we I think I'd have to take that on notice. Um, I know we have expanded the use of sniffer dogs um, particularly, and we have massively increased our uh, intervention, like our manual intervention rates on those high risk pathways. Obviously with um, COVID and the shutdown on international travel, we're not getting the huge volumes of passenger and passenger luggage coming through where the sniffer dogs were also deployed. Um, otherwise, they're predominantly deployed in the mail pathways. And obviously, there's only a couple of ports that um, bring in um, mail in, in a formal international sense, and there's certainly dogs there. So I'm happy to take that on notice for a more definitive answer. But um, the ASF risk in sort of packages, parcels and accompanied luggage is still a priority for us. Looks like we're back now. Oh, lovely. So um, yes, the next part of the thing was to segue from uh, the Commonwealth um, confirming that it had in fact um, got a Commonwealth biosecurity strategy out, which brings it in a closer alignment with a number of states and territories who similarly have products like this um, to a discussion around why and how we would progress to a national strategy. So at this point, I was going to pass over to um, Malcolm Letts, who I'm sure needs no introduction, um, just to as co-chair of the NBC and the head of biosecurity Queensland, um, to give his perspective on the agenda and walk through this issue for us. Thanks, Jo. Um, and I'm, I may not exactly follow the slides, but I think I'll start by saying in terms of the approach, it's not dissimilar the thinking around having a national strategy is not dissimilar to the thinking around having a Queensland biosecurity strategy as opposed to a biosecurity Queensland strategy. That makes sense. So this is not a strategy for the national government. This is a strategy for all partners in the biosecurity space. And as we had a good discussion at the last National Biosecurity Committee meeting about how we actually develop this strategy, because it really does need to be done um, in a 
co-developed space as well. So plenty of opportunities for consultation. Um, we've already nominated that BQMAC, for example, be one of the key bodies that be consulted in this process. This is, as we had discussed previously, um, an important piece from my perspective anyway, in relation to how all the pieces join up at a national level, which Joe's already alluded to. Um, the opportunities to do more in a more collaborative way at ports, for example, um, data that might be valuable for the states and territories in relation to um, us mounting our own surveillance um, efforts around the ports. Um, we've got some really good examples of how this can work very well in the Torres Strait, and you heard Mick Jeffrey talking about that earlier. Um, so th that's that's the concept that we're talking about from from mine in relation to a national biosecurity strategy. Thanks, Gail. So um, I've I've talked about this a bit, but we've had some presentations at a national level to the NBC as well in terms of the changing nature of the threat. And I'm sure most people in the room are fully familiar with the fact that it's only really Australia and New Zealand as major OECD countries, if you like, that take biosecurity seriously. Um, so as a result, we've had African swine fever, red imported fire ants, um, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, lumpy skin disease, a whole bunch of other diseases that are just spreading like wildfire across the globe as a result of increased movements of trade and people. Um, and that means that the threats to us are increasing logarithmically. So we are every container that arrives in Australia is a threat basically because it's coming from somewhere that's got a pest or disease that um, we are concerned about. Um, there's also a whole lot that's been happening in this space. There's, there's an opportunity to capitalise, as Joe said, on the opportunity that COVID presents to us in terms of a greater understanding of the importance of biosecurity, the importance of track and trace, the importance of preparedness. Um, the benefits that arise from working together are obvious. Um, making it happen is not always that easy. Um, and we've also had the IGAB review that was done um, back in 2017 that actually identified quite a few areas for improvement at a national level. We haven't implemented all of those because it's not clear about who has responsibility for that. So from mine, one of the uh, opportunities from a national biosecurity strategy is to actually assign some of those responsibilities. Thanks, Carl. So this is pretty uh, self-evident, I think, but um, it is, it, it, it's obvious that it has to be strategic. From my point of view, it has to look at the national biosecurity system and how it operates, and that's have, about how all the moving parts and all the, all the pieces fit together, and how we actually make them work better together is a, is a, is a key. So the vision, objectives, and outcomes are standard for a strategy, um, but the engagement, I think, across the full um, biosecurity spectrum is a really important piece here going forward. Um, we've already got a whole bunch of things that we that are in place, all the states and territories. Most of us have been moving in the same direction. We've been changing our legislation. We've been developing strategies. The Commonwealth have got their strategies, so we need to bring all of those things together. So these, this is a this is a graphic that tries to pick up um, all the things that that need to be done. Um, I think at the at the state and territory level, we are very appreciative of the efforts that the Commonwealth are putting in to protecting the border because that's actually where we should be investing an enormous amount um, and, so, and the work that's being done around technologies and those sorts of things is critically important. But what role can we play? How can we work better together as, as, as Joe's already, already suggested? So all of, the, all of the knowledge, all of the policy pieces, all of the technologies, how do they fit together? And here we've got a, a good example of that. And I think environment is something that's been underplayed historically in the biosecurity space. Uh, marine and aquatic is fairly new um, and largely is in the um, environment space. It's an interesting, uh, the aquaculture industry and their perspective on biosecurity is interesting at the moment. So I'm really keen for, for them to be in the tent um, going forward. Um, but it, but um, you know that graphic is uh, intended to be all encompassing. Thanks, Carl. So partnerships obviously is a key uh, in this going forward. Uh, who invests and how do we capitalise on, on that investment? The role technology plays is something we've been discussing today. Um, 
Shifting to the left hand side of the curve is absolutely key. Diagnostics plays a critical part in that and faster, more rapid diagnostics is, is absolutely critical and we've learnt that in COVID. Um, sharing the responsibilities going forward, making sure that we've got the capability that we need and that's a challenge. It, it's been really pleasing for me moving into the biosecurity space to see so many young people with a passion about biosecurity. A lot of that's driven, I've got to say, by environment, which is fantastic. Um, but you know, we, if we look back to history, it's all, it, you know, a lot of the interest was driven by industry. Um, we need to you know, capitalise on that enthusiasm and, and, and draw people in. Data and analytics we've had a long discussion about today. Thanks, Carl. So this, these are the things we discussed at the last NBC meeting around the how we engage, um, and this is a critically important piece for our partnership forum. So that co-designed, developed and delivered by the Commonwealth States and Territories is a really important piece of that. So while we're looking to have a first draft prepared by the end of this calendar year, um, the, we don't want to rush the engagement process. So we're going to be working very closely, all the states and territories will be working very, very closely with the Commonwealth to make sure that we identify the relevant people in each uh, jurisdiction um, and bodies to be engaged. Um, flexible and adaptable. Sorry, um, Gail. Oh, no, it's right. Keep going. I know we're running out of time. I want to give people you've had an opportunity to read all that, so we'll move on. That's that's OK. Thank you. Um, so I've already, I guess, discussed this, but there, there'll be a range of different mechanisms and processes to, to, to do this. But these are the things that came out of the last NBC meeting in terms of the important stakeholders um, and the important approaches that we take in terms of having this. Thanks, Mel. I think we're getting close to the end, are we not? Sorry, that was the last slide. That was the last slide, thank you. <laughs> so, um, thanks, Steph. Back to you. We've got a bit of time for questions. I, I, I was under instructions, Joe, to go fast um, because we, would, we did want to leave uh, the opportunity for a bit of Q&A. Yeah, okay. no, we do was have, I, Malcolm, sorry. We do have two <laughs> other presentations coming up and we are running a little bit tight for time. So what I'm going to do is get the questions going in the chat. If we right. time, have time at the end, I'll come back to them. But there is a question from Sandra uh, for yourself, Malcolm, in the chat. And now we're going to move straight on to Richard. Richard is the current Assistant Secretary for Risk and Innovation Branch in DOOR, and he's going to be talking about the biosecurity awareness and targeted education priorities. Over to you, Richard. Thanks all. And I'm just going to get um, Gail to drive here. So I'm hoping you can get the slide up for us, Gail. Let us know. Everyone can see That's that? up now, Richard. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, yeah, look, um, thanks everyone for the opportunity to present today. I'll try and go through this as quickly as possible. And if there's any set of questions, we can take it at the, the very end. Um, but this, it's just talking to everyone about um, some independent research that we had done earlier um, this year. And it was looking at the Australian public's awareness and understanding of biosecurity. Um, Participants were basically um, trying to um, give us a, a response based on their understanding of biosecurity um, and how their attitudes might have changed um, to, to COVID, um, especially in the, the, the first sort of six months of when the, the pandemic did hit. Um, you know, the risks and consequences of a biosecurity breach and impacts on Australian agriculture and the environment, as well as our way of life. And we also looked at things like who has responsibility for biosecurity in Australia, um, what knowledge is there of Australian government activities to manage biosecurity risks, what's expected um, of individuals when they're travelling, um, whether they be shopping online. I think we mentioned mail centres as well, which has seen a bit of a surge during COVID. Um, and then, you know, things like what penalties existed for breaching um, biosecurity laws. Um, we also had some biosecurity related messaging and branding that we, we wanted to sort of um, uh, uh, walk through at the end there and show what we have done. I think someone previously mentioned African swine fever, so we'll show an example there. Um, and we also looked at, um, uh, you know, what sort of images and symbols people associated with biosecurity um, to do with pests and diseases, threats to agriculture and the environment, um, as well as some of the biosecurity activities that, uh, you know, the Australian government already undertakes at the border and, and someone also mentioned detector dogs before. 
Um, Gail's been very good. She's already gone on to the next page, and that sort of basically shows our um, breadth of uh, research participants that we got to um, give input, um, ranging from our farmers. We looked at international travellers. Um, they straddled, I guess, the period just prior to the actual COVID pandemic coming in, as well as during COVID. Um, our online shopper cohort, um, international students, um, you know, a range of those who are currently studying in Australia, called their stands, stands for um, culturally and linguistic um, lead diverse audiences. Um, and, and that was a range of people um, that we, we sourced, as well as import exporters um, and Australian travellers who arrived in Australia during the, um, the COVID-19 restrictions and were introduced or, or spent at least some time in um, quarantine. Um, so when we look at the next slide there, we're sort of looking at, um, you know, what do these groups show in terms of awareness and understanding of biosecurity? Um, as you can see there at the top, um, you know, Australian temporary entrants and international students probably had the lowest level of understanding of biosecurity. Um, to be brutally honest, they're more focused with not getting in trouble with the Australian government and complying with um, uh, the, the law. So that was sort of their focus. Um, our culturally and linguistically diverse audiences had a slightly higher but um, still limited grasp. And again, that could be from inter, um, English as a second language, for example. Um, we then had a number of other um, uh, higher ranked people up to farmers um, in terms of their understanding of biosecurity and requirements. Just jumping through to the next slide there, and we're looking at, you know, what does the term biosecurity um, mean? And, and the common view for, for pretty much all the respondents was that it was around security and protection and, and COVID, you know, the pandemic itself has highlighted that. And that's mainly focused around uh, the environment, plants and animals, um, things like uh, border declarations. You would have seen the new uh, digital passenger declaration details that are coming out soon. Um, so, you know, a lot of those sorts of things were, were identified as um, uh, requirements or associations. Um, international students and in our um, call sort of groups associated the word biosecurity with probably more the negative concept of control. While a number of our other sort of international travellers, due to the experiences that they did have at the border um, associated with quarantine protocols. Um, farmers were the ones who are most likely to cite penalties or fines uh, for undeclared items um, as, as their top five, um, as did uh, our restricted arrivals. Um, and a, a number of other responses included protecting the clean and green food grown in Australia um, as their top five sort of concept associations. Um, based on the research that has been done in the last few years, it, it's pretty obvious that sh um, views have shifted um, and made people realise that everyone has a role to play in, in keeping Australia safe from pests and diseases. Um, just on the next slide there, Gail. Um, interestingly, we looked here at what organisations or what people associated organisations um, were responsible for biosecurity, um, about 25% came in as ABF or the Australian Border Force and 20% more generally as the Australian Government. Um, but the, the variation in responses that you can see there across all the groups show that um, no one's exactly sure who is responsible or has uh, particular sort of jurisdiction for, for those roles or stood out as a majority. Um, interestingly, previous brands such as the Australian Quarantine Inspection Service or AQUIS um, was noted, as well as Crime Stoppers. Um, I'm not sure how Crime Stoppers got in there, but it shows that they're uh, obviously doing a good, good work in terms of advertising. Um, just jumping across onto the next slide there. So, you know, these sort of general responses are showing that there's um, a need for a recognisable biosecurity brand. Um, have you got, yeah, okay, thanks, Gal. Um, five key themes that sort of came out are around um, security, protection, um, I mentioned control before, but wellbeing, um, as well as sort of maintaining our way of life. Um, the majority of these themes with the exclusion of control sort of affiliate to this work um, and again supports the role that everyone has a, a role to play in our biosecurity system. Just jumping across onto the, the next slide there, Gail, and I, I just mentioned this before in terms of the, the I guess the transition over the last few years, but um, previous research that we've conducted shows that, um, you know, there hadn't been much awareness of biosecurity, um, what it is and, and the level of responsibility to support that system. 
um, probably since what mid 2019 when the COVID pandemic really hit in Australia that certainly changed. Um, it, it's brought with it a heightened awareness of individual and sort of collective responsibility there for biosecurity. Um, that said, there's, there's still a lot of work to do, but this is already providing, um, while well, COVID has been a fairly negative impact on, on everyone, but it's uh, provided us with a platform to leverage off this sort of work and, and raise awareness. Um, I think Joe mentioned this before, but um, uh, we're also looking at things like um, a, a biosecurity communication engagement strategy that will roll out over the next four years. Um, it, it's a theme that's sort of looking at um, enhancing biosecurity awareness, that concept of shared responsibility, as well as sort of target ac activities um, in, in the Australian community. And there, Gail's already just beat me to it there. So on the next slide, you can see um, some of the targeted biosecurity work that we've done um, for key threats and risk cohorts along what we call the biosecurity continuum. Um, the, the one up the top left there is the African swine fever. Um, we did it over about three to four months from December 2019 to around March 2020. Uh, blended approach using you know, digital social media, um, advertisements aligned with keyword searches, um, tailored our language, especially for our culturally and linguistically diverse audience, um, even signage at international airports. We put um, plugs in like the Qantas magazine, for example. Um, information at air cargo locations and um, also used our offshore network um, of agriculture councillors as well. So um, it, it really, really worked quite well. Um, Joe also mentioned that we are a risk based biosecurity system and that also extends to these sort of general education activities. We try and use data around our, I guess, our highest risk areas um, and making sure that we're, we're channeling our communication efforts where it's most needed, including tailoring it according to language. Um, so not everyone speaks English um, and making sure that we also evaluate the effectiveness of these activities. Um, just on the next slide there, I'm just going to show a couple of um, targeted sort of social media campaigns. Thanks, Gail. Um, so a couple there look at, um, you know, where we've we broached out to online shoppers, specifically gardeners and pet owners, for example. We did a series of online posts um, between May and July in 2020. Um, a, a lot of those people who are, are online sort of uh, and tech savvy would be aware of what this means, but um, we got about 1.5 million impressions, um, which for those who don't know, it's how many times um, it was shown on a particular social media feed and about 400,000 um, plus users actually reached. And that means those people who saw the post and engaged with the, the links and the information that was in it. Um, we also had another really good one on um, buying live plants online um, through Facebook. Uh, we ran that through the month of June, which was really well received. I think we had about, um, again, 450,000 impressions, which means um, it showed up on social media feeds and of that um, a, a bit, I think it's about 380,000, yeah, um, users actually reached. That means they engaged with it and used it. So um, pretty good in terms of targeted and, and bang for buck. And um, just on the next slide here, yep, thanks, Gail. So um, we've also recently launched our Australian Biosecurity webinar and podcast series. Um, and that's two forms that we're sort of looking at to try and spread out the, the way that we, um, uh, uh, I guess, share the information that is biosecurity and what people can do and, and build that awareness. Um, the, the Detect and Protect podcast series, that's a mouthful, um, aims to educate the general audience on biosecurity topics through what we would just call casual conversations with biosecurity experts. Um, there's one that you can find already online there. It was um, an episode on detector dogs. Um, I even made my poor boys sit through it, but um, they actually did like it. it. It was really well received. And the next one coming up is um, our Deputy Secretary, Andrew Tung, is going to be talking about managing growing risks uh, to deliver a strong biosecurity program. Um, the Australian Biosecurity webinar series commenced in July. It's been well received already. Um, covers a range of topics looking at Australia's priority biosecurity risks how they're being managed, preparedness and response activities and things like that. Um, we've had an average of over 300 people join each of these sort of webinar series um, and it's continuing to grow. Um, and if I could just give a bit of a plug here, um, we've also got our Australian Biosecurity Awards coming up in November. 
COVID permitting, um, we're looking at um, the event being hosted here in Canberra, and that's looking at obviously recognising we host it annually, but recognising ind individuals, groups and organisations that have shown real commitment to supporting and promoting um, the biosecurity system. So we look forward to announcing the 2021 winners there, um, and, and that'll be on the 10th of November. Um, noting the time, we'll just, I think we're at the end there anyway. Um, and, and again, I think Joe also mentioned this and Malcolm, um, we've also got a national biosecurity website, which is live. Uh, it was launched in June. Um, it's on there on the screen there, and I think we'll put it in the chat as well. So um, uh, have a go and, and uh, let us know if you've got anything there. We're always on the lookout for um, future topics, speakers, things like that. Um, so if I can give a bit of a plug for that, um, we'd, we'd certainly welcome any, any input. Noting the time, I'll uh, leave it there, but um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, Richard. That was great. Now we are really tight on time today, so I'm going to keep us moving. I'm going to ask Richard if you could keep an eye on the chat and answer people's questions as they come through on the chat. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Next up today, we have Claire Lenahan, and she's going to walk us through a Safer Online Seeds project. Over to you, Claire. Sorry, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, just waiting for my tech to all coordinate. Hi, everybody. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm Claire Lenahan. Uh, I'm from the uh, Behavioural Analysis Team at the Department of Agriculture, Border and the Environment. And I'll be talking to you today about a project that uh, my team has run to investigate how to encourage people uh, to make uh, some safer online overseas seed purchases. Um, and you're lucky today because you're getting a bit of a sneak peek before we submit our final report on this project. Uh, so I'm just going to make the caveat that because of this, the findings we're discussing a preliminary and the final iteration might look a little bit different. So um, we conducted an earlier project uh, in the department that found Australians ordering seeds from overseas vendors was a priority behaviour um, that could be addressed through a behavioural approach. Um, and as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, ordering seeds from overseas is a serious biosecurity risk um, and we just can't keep up uh, with the screening um, of all of the incoming um, pieces of mail. Um, we all know that biosecurity incidences and mail volumes are increasing and they're going to continue to do so, um, particularly uh, due to the popularity of online purchasing, which has increased during COVID. Um, whilst the department has ideas about why we buy seeds online, there's little knowledge about um, who's buying their seeds online and whether a behavioural intervention can address this behaviour. Um, and so what is the behavioural intervention? I know you guys have seen um, some stuff about uh, behavioural research. Um, hopefully this won't be repeating too much, um, but the aim of our behavioural intervention is to positively influence people to change their behaviour. Uh, importantly, we're going to do this while maintaining freedom of choice. It operates on the understanding that we don't have unlimited energy and resources, so we're forced to make choices we wouldn't necessarily make if we had the time and ability to consider the pros and cons of everything we do. Um, so our field uh, just aims to make it easier for people to make the choices they'd probably otherwise uh, want to make. It's not about forcing people to do things that they don't want to do. Um, and since most policy relates to people's behaviour in one way or another, knowing what is motivating people and what barriers they face can help us design and implement better policies and services. Uh, so we do this um, in three main phases. Uh, our team aims to understand the issue in context, build interventions and then test and refine them accordingly. And the arrow going both ways uh, recognises that this isn't always a linear process. Uh, the project that I'm discussing with you today sits firmly in the understand box. Uh, there'll be later iterations of this project that will get into the build and test phases. However, before we can do that, we really need to have a clear understanding of our users. We could easily sit in the Canberra bubble and decide that all that's necessary to solve our pro problem is the certification program and an education campaign. But uh, without understanding our users, we have no idea if that would be effective. Uh, so 
uh, to better understand our users, we ran a total of 29 qualitative interviews, which is a little different, I think, from the research you've seen um, currently. Uh, each interview went for one hour. All interviews were conducted digitally, thank you to COVID. Uh, the aim was to talk to participants who had purchased seeds online from overseas. However, due to ethical considerations, we had to exclude those who had intentionally broken the law in doing so. Uh, so why a qualitative interview, um, which is, as I mentioned, a little bit different to the methods previously discussed? And my slides are taking a little longer to catch up. So, um, OK, here we go. The purpose of a qualitative interview is a little different from a survey because we're not looking for statistically significant findings. I mean, how could we? We're only interviewing 29 people. What we are looking for are unique insights that our participants can give us about the issue at hand. And this can be particularly helpful in behavioral contexts. We often think we're targeting a single behavior when we seek to fix a problem, like preventing people from buying dangerous seeds online. Uh, but actually our users are often making many decisions and actions. Lots of these are unconscious. Interviewing our users allows us to understand their activity, the decisions they made, why they made those decisions and how. And so the interview process, when conducted properly, allows the interviewer to probe deeper into the user's activity than would be possible with a method that relies only on self-report. So this allows us to better isolate where in this activity we might be able to nudge our users towards compliance. Uh, a handy way of thinking about the different factors that need to be present for a behavior to occur and the factors that we would like to target to change that behavior is the COMBI model. And the model outlines that a combination of capability, motivation and opportunity lead to a behavior. So a capability refers to the physical and psychological skills required to enact the behavior. So in our situation, this would be the physical skills required to operate a computer and the psychological capability to understand the online shopping process. Opportunity refers to the physical opportunities presented by the environment and the social opportunities presented by the culture our users find themselves in. And motivation refers to both reflective and automatic motivation. Uh, reflective motivation includes your beliefs about what is good and bad, your conscious intentions, your decisions and plans. Automatic motivation refers to the emotional responses, desires, impulses and habits you formed. So we use this model to organize the insights we collected and help us target our findings. So we get to the fun bit uh, where I get to share with you some of our findings. Obviously, we're not going to go into everything because of time constraints, um, but I can give you key takeaways. And I will make the caveat at this point that the sentences you see on the screen are quotes from our users and do not represent the views of the department. I've included them so you can see the kinds of insights that we use to base our findings on. Um, biggest takeaway, our users do not generally know what compliance would be in this context, let alone how to do it. And you can see that right there with quote number one. Um, they had decent capability around biosecurity at the border, uh, both state and national, and our colleagues from Tasmania, Queensland and South Australia will be pleased to hear that our users from these states had a more salient understanding of state based biosecurity requirements than at a national level. Uh, I don't have a quote for that one, but uh, you can see our second quote relating to um, awareness of biosecurity at an airport. However, their understanding of biosecurity did not seem to extend to seeds being sent through the mail pathway. Often it wasn't until our users were prompted to think about similarities between buying seeds online and bringing them into the country via the travel pathway that they made the connection that seeds could pose a biosecurity risk. In multilingual contexts, there were also serious concerns that users would not know the English or scientific name for the seeds they were trying to buy and entering their native language into Google could increase the chances they may inadvertently purchase seeds from overseas. When it comes to online shopping in general, our users were capable and discerning and most were very comfortable cancelling a transaction, even at the point of purchase. This often happened if they discovered information that caused concern, and many suggested that information about biosecurity laws would impact their decision to purchase a product, which is really promising. When it comes to opportunities, we found there are a lot of incidental opportunities that did support compliance in users who are not specifically looking to buy from overseas. Retailers like Bunnings have excellent reputations and are accessible and are often the first place users go in the purchasing process, as you can see in uh, quotes one and two <laughs> here on this slide. Um, when larger retailers do not carry the range the user requires, a reason often cited for looking elsewhere, our users expressed preferences for buying from Australian sources for many reasons. These included Australia's reputation for quality, speed and delivery, and a perception of, uh, sorry, of additional protection under Australian consumer law. Um, 
and then. However, social influences such as Instagram, friends who've experienced growing more exotic plants like chilies uh, and familial connections to other countries encourage our users to try growing plants that are harder to find through larger retailers. Uh, so we've got uh, point one. Uh, yeah, but for the exotic, you know, I want to try it. This can lead to our users looking for seeds in places like eBay and Etsy, and there is little opportunity in these contexts for the users to be reminded of biosecurity requirements or to easily check what the correct thing to do is. Uh, you see the second quote, I jumped on eBay and without realizing that the account was a foreign one. The ideal scenario would be that users would check Biocon, the Australian Biosecurity Import Conditions Database, to identify the conditions in which they could import the desired seeds. However, without the capability to check compliance and with a lack of opportunity presented in the purchasing process, this doesn't occur. And so we've got uh, our third quote, uh, which uh, expresses a complete lack of understanding about what Biocon is. Um, there was a surprising amount of motivation to buy seeds online in a way that would comply with biosecurity laws. Our users seem to be consistent in believing that buying seeds in a dodgy way wouldn't be worth the effort. Seeds are a cheap product, and while they may want the plant it's worth, um, it isn't worth getting into trouble over. And I think this really echoes some of um, the findings that we heard uh, just previously. Additionally, some were concerned about having their seeds caught up in customs and not wanting to pay fees or fines in addition to the price of seeds, which is usually quite cheap. Um, there were many strong identity based motivations for being compliant seed purchases. Many of our users were quite environmentally conscious and were concerned that their purchases could have an impact on the environment, but that was once they were prompted to think about the risk posed by seeds. Others were very aware that a pest incursion could have significant impact on agriculture and were concerned about impacting an industry or having an incursion impact the cost of products at the supermarkets. And uh, the case of prawns was mentioned uh, in that scenario. Um, and you can see our second quote on this slide, uh, it could wipe out a whole industry. If it got in here, that's referring to the canning industry. Um, so there was some really positive awareness. Um, buying Australian was a strong motivation for several reasons, including to support the economy because Australian products are perceived as higher quality. And again, because there's a perception that users are less likely to be scammed if they're buying Australian products. Uh, most of our users said that they were happy to buy only from Australian sources if asked, as it would be much simpler for them. When we looked at motivations to buy seeds in a non-compliant manner, we found the strongest takeaway in our users was a lack of identification as somebody who's responsible for caring or knowing about biosecurity when buying seeds online. And I think that's a trend we've been seeing with our um, previous presentations. Our users didn't identify as importers of seeds and therefore didn't identify Bicon as being a tool for them once they were told uh, what Bicon was because there was very little awareness of it. Um, and we can see that in quote one, wouldn't use a website like Bicon as they don't import seeds. There was a perception that seed sellers should be responsible for not sending seeds where they aren't allowed and a very strong perception that the government either was policing the seed selling sites or was checking everything that came in by mail. Um, and you see, um, Coming from a buying perspective, I trust the Australian government has checked. Shows like border security were often mm. cited as proof the government was um, entirely responsible and also seemed to give the impression that the government is a much better resource to check everything coming in uh, than what we know it actually is. So how do we intervene? What does this tell us? Our users need to be educated about the risks of buying seeds uh, online from overseas. They need to develop the capability to know that every time they're order ordering something from overseas, they're actually importing something into the country and that there are responsibilities inherent in that action. Our users are from different education levels and different cultural backgrounds, um, as we mentioned earlier with that uh, research previously, and they need an easy way of checking that they're buying seeds online in a manner that complies with biosecurity law. In this case, something like a certification program for online seed sellers would go a long way to give our users the opportunity to comply once they have the capability to know that they need to. Finally, there are many motivations from a concern for consequences, their identity as someone who cares about the environment or who wants to support the Australian economy that we can leverage when we build their capability and provide them with opportunities to comply to ensure that uh, the intervention that we design is more effective. 
we now have the proof from our research to more successfully build and test an intervention for the second phase. So what does this mean? Our findings will be incorporated into the next phase of the research, the build phase. Uh, the department is in the process of recruiting external suppliers to assist our team in developing a behavioural intervention based on the findings I just took you through. Taking the time to do user research instead of relying on the findings of previous studies means the department has a much clearer idea of the behaviour of users that we actually want to target. When running behavioural interventions, this is a very important part of the process as behaviour is really context dependent. Studies on similar situations in other countries might have very different social and physical opportunities to us uh, and not taking this into account will impact how our users will behave. So without achieving that understanding, we might invest a lot of time and money into testing an intervention that was never going to work for us. So um, yeah, and this cartoon kind of illustrates that concept that um, different contexts can have a huge impact on user behavior. The added bonus is we have a lot of data that has already be, been identified as being helpful to other teams in our biosecurity area who are working in the communication space. And this really demonstrates how invaluable this kind of work is. Having a good understanding of our users pays off in more ways than you might originally think. And I'd be happy to discuss this if we have time for questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Um, really great to hear from both yourself and Richard there um, and really expanding, I guess, on the conversations we've been having throughout today um, about the importance of, of understanding your audience that you're engaging with and being able to use that in the way that we drive behaviour change. So great to get that from both of you. We are just about out of time today. I haven't seen any questions come through just in the last minute here. So what I think we might do is close out. We're pretty close to end. And thank you to all of our speakers this afternoon at the roundtable. We appreciate the update on each of those projects. Um, if you have any further questions in the meantime, feel free to send them in the chat or through to us, and we will redirect those questions to the appropriate speakers for them to get back to you after today. For those who are joining us tomorrow at the Queensland Biosecurity Partners Forum, we'll be back online at 12.45 for our final day of this year's event with a focus on technology, a partnership vote and a series of workshops again just to close out the forum. So thanks everybody, much appreciated. Any final words, Malcolm? Might not have Malcolm there, so I think we'll close it out right there. Thanks everybody. Sorry. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow. Cheers.